Chapter 10 The path led Holt, Will and Horace a little east of south, and the coastline was angling out to the west. So as they travelled, they moved further and further away from the sea. The constant salt-laden wind died away and they began to see trees again. The land itself was wild and hilly, covered for the main part in gorse and heather. It lacked the gentle green beauty of the southern parts of Araluan that Will and Horace were accustomed to. But it had its own form of beauty, wild and rugged and unkempt. Even the trees, as they began to appear with greater frequency, seemed to stand as if challenging the elements to do their worst, their roots wide set in the sandy ground, their branches thick and braced like brawny arms. They had travelled perhaps a kilometre when Holt gave a low grunt. He swung down from the saddle and stepped off the trail to examine something. Will and Horace, riding single file behind him, dismounted and moved to peer over his shoulder. He was studying a small tuft of cloth, caught on a branch of tough heather that grew beside the trail. What do you make of that, Will? Cloth, Will said. Then, as Holt looked piercingly at him, he realised that he had stated the obvious, and his mentor wanted more from him. He reached out and touched the small fragment, feeling it, rolling it gently between his forefinger and thumb. It was a smooth linen weave, perhaps from a shirt, he thought. It's nothing like the rough plaid the Scotty wear, he said thoughtfully. Now he realised why they wove that thick, rough cloth. The heather and gorse of their homeland would rip anything lighter to shreds within a few weeks. Good work, Holt said approvingly. Horace smiled as he watched his two friends, crouched by either side of the track. In some ways, he knew, Holt would never stop teaching the young ranger. Will would always be his apprentice. And, as he had the thought, he realised that Will, without thinking about it, would probably always want it that way. So, what else occurs to you? Holt asked. Will looked around, studying the sandy path they had been travelling, seeing traces there that people had passed this way within the previous few days. But the rain and wind had made it almost impossible to deduce whether they had all travelled together or were in several separate parties. I'm wondering why the owner wasn't walking on the path itself. Why would he be shoving his way through the bushes when there's a clear path? Holt said nothing. But his body language, as he leaned towards Will and nodded encouragingly, told the young ranger that he was on the right track. He looked at the path again, at the jumble of footprints, one over the other. The path is narrow, he said finally, no room for more than two abreast. The person wearing this, he indicated the small piece of material, was jostled off the path by the numbers. Maybe he stopped for a moment and he was bumped aside. So we're following a large group of travellers. I'd say there are more than a dozen of them, Holt said. The innkeeper said Tennyson had about 20 people with him, Will said. Holt nodded. Exactly, and I'd guess we're a day or two behind them. They stood erect. Horace shook his head in admiration. You mean you can figure all that out just from one little scrap of cloth? Holt regarded him sardonically. He was still bristling a little from Horace saying, That's a fancy term for a guess, the previous day. Holt didn't forget criticism. No, he said, we're guessing. We just wanted to make it sound scientific. Holt paused for a few seconds, as if inviting Horace to make some kind of reply. But wisely, Horace chose not to. Finally, the ranger gestured to the path ahead of them. Let's get moving, he said. The wind had blown away the rain clouds of the previous night, and the sky above them was a brilliant blue, even though the air temperature was cold and crisp. The heather that surrounded them varied in colour from deep brown to dull purple. 
Under the bright sunlight, it seemed to shimmer with colour. Will spotted the next fragment of cloth almost by chance. It was nothing more than a thread, really, snagged on another branch, this time one growing close to the path. And it would have been easy to miss in the purple heather because it blended in. It, too, was purple. Will signalled Horace, who was riding behind him, to rein in. Then he leaned down from the saddle and plucked the thread from the bush. Halt! he called. The bearded ranger checked Abelard and swivelled in the saddle. He squinted at the purple thread on Will's forefinger, then smiled slowly. And who do we know who wears purple? The Genovesans, Will replied. Holt took a deep breath. So, it looks like we're on the right track. That was confirmed for them a few kilometres later. They smelt it first. The wind was too strong for the smoke to hang in the sky. It was blown away almost instantly. But the smell of burnt, charred wood and thatch, and something else, carried to them. Smoke, Will said, reining in and turning his face to the wind to try to catch the scent more clearly. There was a faint trace of something else, something he'd smelt before when he had been following the trail of one of Tennyson's raiding parties far away to the south in Hibernia. It was the smell of burnt flesh. Then Holt and Horace caught the scent too. Will exchanged a glance with his teacher and knew he'd recognised that ominous smell as well. Come on, said Holt, and he urged Abelard into a canter, even though he knew they were already too late. The crofter's cottage had stood in cleared ground a few hundred metres from the path. Now it was a pile of blackened ruins, still smoking a day after it had been consumed by fire. One section of the thatched roof remained partly intact, but its support structure had collapsed and it lay at an angle, propped up by the charred remnants of one wall. Thatch must have been damp, Holt said. It didn't burn completely. They'd reined in a few metres short of the cottage. There was nobody left alive here. The bodies of a man and a woman sprawled face down in the long grass. There had been a second building beyond the cottage, a barn, Will guessed. It too had been burned to ashes. There was nothing left of its walls, although... As with the cottage, some sections of the damp thatch had survived, only to collapse into the ruins. Tug sidestepped nervously as Will urged him towards the barn. The smell of burnt flesh was much stronger here, and the horse objected to it. Among the ashes, Will could see two large charred bodies. Cattle, he thought. Easy boy, Will told Tug. The little horse tossed his head uncomfortably, as if apologising for his nervous reaction. Then he steadied. Will swung himself down from the saddle and heard a low warning rumble in Tug's chest. It's all right, he told the horse. Whoever did this is long gone. And it soon became apparent who had done it. Will knelt beside the body of the crofter, and gently moved the man's tangled plaid to one side, from where it had bunched up as he had fallen. Concealed by the folds of rough wool, he found the implements that had killed him. Two crossbow bolts, barely a centimetre apart, buried deep in the man's back. There was little blood. At least one of the bolts must have hit the man's heart, killing him almost instantly. That was something to be grateful for, at least, Will thought. He looked up. Holt and Horace were still sitting their horses, watching him. Crossbow, he said. Not a Scotty weapon, Holt observed. Will shook his head. No, I've seen bolts like this before. They're Genovesan. Tennyson has been here. Horace looked around the tragic little scene. His expression was a mixture of sadness and disgust. 
Picta and the Scotti might nominally be enemies of Araluen, but these people weren't soldiers or raiders. They were simple country folk, going about their day-to-day business, working hard and scraping a meagre living from this tough northern land. Why, he said, why kill them? In his young life, Horace had seen his share of battles and knew there was no glamour in war. But at least in war, soldiers knew their fate was in their own hands. They could kill or be killed. They had a chance to defend themselves. This was the pitiless slaughter of innocent, unarmed civilians. Holt indicated another corpse, further away and half concealed in the long grass. There was a small cloud of flies buzzing about, and a crow hopped on top of it, ripping at the carcass with its dagger of a beak. It was all that was left of another of the crofter's cattle. But this one had been killed and butchered for its meat. They wanted food, he said, so they took it. When the crofter objected, they killed him and his wife and burned their house and barn. But why? They could have overpowered him, surely. Why kill him? Holt shrugged. They've still got a way to go to the border, he said. I guess they didn't want to leave anyone behind who could raise the alarm against them. He looked around now, but saw no sign of other habitation. I'll bet there are half a dozen other little crofts like this within a few kilometres. Chances are there's a hamlet or village as well. Tennyson wouldn't want to take the risk that these people might gather a party and come after him. He's a murdering swine, Horace said quietly, as he listened to Holt's reasoning. The bearded ranger gave a slight snort of disgust. Are you only beginning to figure that out? he asked. 